Thank you. <laughs> um, can I start? Yeah? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, yeah. So, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so, thank you very much for being here on a Saturday afternoon, which is not obvious, right? That you come to a uh, data science event on a Saturday afternoon, so thanks a lot. I personally am very, I'm very, very happy to be here, and I think I said it already, but I'm very happy to be here because A, I love data, obviously, and B, I love festivals, as you can see from these wristbands here. Okay, so, um, but yeah, my name is Miriam, I'm a research scientist at the Bell Labs in Cambridge, and my background is computer vision, which, as you might know, is that branch of artificial intelligence that studies ways to analyze and understand images. And what I'm going to tell you today is actually a kind of different perspective because um, we are going to see how computer vision can be used to tell stories out of visual data and understand even how humans perceive um, visual data and visual content around us. So just a few words about where I work. So I'm uh, within the Bell Labs, I'm in the social dynamics team, where we are essentially a bunch of uh, interdisciplinary, say, uh, scientists um, with the main aim of quantifying intangible properties of human behavior using a computational approach. So trying to uh, detect and analyze everything that is not directly quantifiable from any type of data, from social media data, sensor data, uh, weather data, any type of data. So the intangible is, is what we are, t we are chasing for and um, typically our, um, our way of doing research is, a long, is uh, through a long-term vision and long-term fashion typical and historical of, of the Bell Labs. Um, okay, so let me start about uh, the, the talk. So um, as we said, as I said, my background is computer vision. And for the, those of you who don't know, uh, computer vision is essentially about building tools that given an image are able to detect objects, visible objects, tangible objects, uh, things like uh, faces and the identity. This is, this is how Facebook does it, right? With my, with my <laughs> profile picture. Um, and the identity of the person depicted, but also any kind of object scenes or, and activities. Now, um, thanks to, so the uh, um, computer vision nowadays is able to detect these objects with a shape, these objects that are tangible, that are quantifiable, that you can possibly touch in the pictures that you can definitely name in the pictures that you can they, you can see their shape and it does so with an impressive accuracy thanks to recent developments in in, in deep learning um, and I can tell you it has not always been like that because when I started in my PhD we couldn't distinguish between birds and airplanes we couldn't teach computer to distinguish between birds and airplanes and I spent most of my PhD working about quantifying uh, tangible properties of visual data using computer vision. And it's not that I got bored after a while, but actually uh, I soon realized, and together with my colleagues, we soon realized that when we look at an image, we don't only see what is visible, what is tangible, everything with a shape. Because if you think about it, when you look at an image, you also perceive a set of in intangible properties um, subjective attributes that you necessarily evaluate when you look at a picture, but you can't really see their shape. Things like image beauty or image sentiment. I can say, this image makes me happy, but I won't see the shape of sentiment as I see the shape of face. I won't see the shape of, of aesthetic value as I see the shape of face. And so detecting, detecting these shapeless properties is not an obvious task for traditional machine vision framework. Um, because those intangible properties are not directly quantifiable. And so uh, my job and our job at the Bell Labs is to, is to build effective, as we call, subjective machine vision tools that can effectively uh, detect these intangible subjective properties in visual data. And essentially we do, those, we do so by opening up the boundaries of computer vision and embraces, embrace uh, theories and, and studies from branches of human knowledge that have absolutely nothing to do with computer vision or with computer uh, science, such as the so social sciences, the visual art, psychology, anthropology. So we embed this knowledge into a computer vision framework to effectively detect subjective properties. 
So in the next few slides, what I'm going to show you is, is what does this subjective machine vision mean and, and how we can use these techniques to actually understand human perception and subjective perception of visual data. Um, so one of the most popular branches of this subjective machine vision is called computational aesthetics. And what we do in computational aesthetics is that we design algorithm that given an image are able to automatically score it in terms of its beauty degree, its photographic quality, the aesthetic appeal, so how beautiful the image is. And we essentially do so by, by uh, encoding into a, a machine learning framework a lot of knowledge from photographic theory. And just to give you an example, I'd like to show you a study that we did um, a couple of years ago uh, about building a computational aesthetic framework specific for us, uh, for a narrow image domain, which is a domain of portraits, so images with faces only. So we designed this framework that given a, a, a portrait, a face image, would automatically able to be able to score it in terms of its beauty. Note that we didn't want to, to understand the beauty of the person depicted. We wanted to detect automatically the beauty of the image composition, knowing that there was a person in it. And the reason why we needed a specific computational aesthetic framework for faces is that it's well known from a number of uh, disciplines, including the psychology and, uh, and uh, uh, neuroscience, the faces occupy uh, a specific, oh thanks, a specific, <laughs> no but that was better actually, <laughs> that was much better. Uh, so um, faces occupy a, a specific um, place in our affective sphere. So face detection and, and processing is one of the earliest and most, <laughs> it's a kind of disco party, I like it, yeah? <laughs> so uh, earliest and, and most uh, developed human skills, face detection and, and face processing. And um, so faces are so special that even portrait photography is a separate branch of photography with dedicated rows and, and, and books because actually portrait photographers need to, need to follow specific uh, photographic rules to convey the, the subject humanity. And so given all this, this motivation, we designed this specific framework for faces by essentially uh, studying uh, portrait photography literature and mapping each of the rules that photographers follow to shoot good portraits into a visual features, into a kind of signal processing based algorithm that expose uh, aesthetic properties of, of the image. And then we give everything to a machine learning framework that effectively scores portraits in terms of beauty. Now, uh, I can tell you, please believe me, it works pretty well. I skip, you know, the, the plots that we, uh, we as scientists like a lot, you know, that to show that it works well. But I think one of the most interesting things of this, of this framework is that because we build on top of deep learning framework to make our feature um, interpretable, so to, m uh, to map uh, exactly photographic rows, then we can understand when we look at how the algorithm behave in a science aesthetic scores, what makes a portrait beautiful from an algor algorithmic perspective. So we can say that, for example, there are some uh, properties of the pictures that are positively related to portrait beauty, such as, for example, the sharpness of, of the face landmarks, the eyes and the nose. And this is well known among portrait photographers, and, but of course this is uh, completely da data driven. So um, it, this kind of confirms uh, that actually the algorithm is looking at the right things when, when um, scoring images in terms of beauty. And there are a set of, of, of features also that are negatively related to portrait beauty. Um, and those features are about essentially having the image being too dull, so, such as, for example, uh, flattened exposure or, or things like that. And then there is a third group of features that actually does not correlate at all with portrait beauty. And this might get frustrating when you are a scientist and you design features and then they don't work because they're not predictive. You are frustrated because you can essentially trash them. But in this case, I always leave them there because those are demographics features. So this essentially tells us that no matter the age, the race or the gender of the person depicted, if the photographer does a good job, then the resulting portrait will be beautiful. And I think this is a very nice message, and especially 
uh, during these interesting times. I always like to have it there. Um, okay. And so because we were very happy about our uh, results and our work in computational aesthetic, we decided to push a bit the boundaries of what subjective machine vision can do and try to understand from a computational perspective the even more subjective notion of creativity in visual data. And to, to do so, we focus on a specific online uh, micro video sharing platform called Vine. You might know Vine. Vine is a platform that allows users to create and share videos with a maximum length of, of six seconds. And this might not surprise you, but actually visual artists, um, uh, Vine became a big phenomenon among, among visual artists because they realized how the six second constraint would incredibly foster their creativity and would be a major driver for their creative process. And so Vine became a, a very big phenomenon and, and it, since its birth, it was linked to the notion of creativity. So after this you know, fantastic introduction, you might think that all Vine videos are creative and we don't need to work on them. But actually, if you look at them and if you study them like we did, 99% look very much like this, like the cat one. It's not a particularly creative video, right? Um, so motivated by, by, by this uh, uneven distribution, we decided to build this framework that would get automatically rid of the cat and surface the beautifully creative video out there in the Vine stream. And okay, so we decided, you know, to, to design this, this machine vision framework to expose creative videos. And when we actually said this to our colleagues, everybody told us we were a bit crazy because creativity is very subjective, but even more, how, how do you even define something creative? how do you define creativity? And actually they were right, because creativity has been defined by pretty much every discipline of human knowledge. Um, from education, to mathematics, to computer science, to, to uh, sociology. Everybody has uh, his or her own way of defining creativity. But we studied it a lot, and what we actually found is that everybody agrees that something creative is something new, so novel compared to artifacts of the same class, and valuable, so that has some benefit for the final user, for the observer. And so uh, by, by defining something creative as new and valuable, uh, we could find a very systematic definition of creativity that we really needed. And even in, in, in artificial intelligence, they use this kind of a systematic um, definition of creativity. And we need systematic definition of creativity because eventually this is going to be processed by a machine. And so we can't be super fuzzy. So uh, th thank, uh, thankful, uh, we, are, we are very thankful to um, all the all the researchers that studied uh, systematic definitions of creativity, because with this definition we could go on in our process and, for example, ask uh, a lot of people out there and through crowdsourcing to annotate a bunch of Vine videos in terms of creativity and also design specific um, visual features that could expose creative traits of the video. So we design, inspired by photographic theory and filmmaking techniques, um, visual features that could expose the artistic value of the video. So uh, how beautiful the video is, how much effective response it generates, etc. And then um, another group of features to uh, expose the artistic novelty of the video. So how different the video is compared to other videos in the Vine stream. And this is easily quantifiable uh, when, you, when, you cluster, um, when you cluster features, the videos in the, in, the, in the feature space, and then you compute how far a new video is from these clusters. This is essentially the, the visual, video artistic novelty feature. Now we had a bu this bunch of features exposing um, creative traits. We give everything to a machine learning framework that will be able to distinguish between creative and non-creative video and actually does so to our surprise with unimpressive accuracy because our system is able to detect creative videos with 80% of accuracy, which is, I don't know if you know it, but this is pretty high for a computer vision task. Um, and also again, because 
our features, so the design of our feature is driven from literature. Uh, we can also understand what makes a video creative from an algorithmic perspective. And so we found that features such as the novelty of the visual patterns and the presence of looping artifacts are positive indicators of video creativity. And with this, doesn't work, yes. Okay, so this is, uh, so as a last uh, di subjective dimension uh, I'd like to explore today, let's talk about sentiment. There is very little which is uh, more subjective than sentiment. And uh, so actually this is a project uh, that we started about two years ago with uh, many researchers from all around the world. And the aim of the project was to design machine vision frameworks that given an image would automatically score it in terms of sentiment. But when we started talking, we soon realized that we couldn't do this without including the notion of culture in this study. Because from mm, psychology and anthropology literature, we know that one of the main factors that might impact emotion perception and visual emotion perception is the cultural background where we grew up. And so we designed this entire framework that will allow us, the whole community, and everybody who is out there who's interested is still an ongoing project. So uh, we are happy to, to have new people on board. So what we wanted to do is to study the impact of culture in visual emotion perception using a computational approach. And so obviously the first step to reach this goal because we are talking about computational perspectives, right? So was to collect data. So we collect this large data set called the Multilingual Visual Sentiment Ontology, which spans about 8 million Flickr pictures. Uh, and each picture is annotated in two dimensions. The cultural dimension, so the language of the picture, of the user who uploaded the picture, and the positive negative sentiment value. Um, and by, by doing so, we have this, this very richly annotated uh, data set. And the first thing that we did was to do a very shallow analysis of what we have in the data set. And so, for example, one of the main findings of this analysis is that, so we use a, a face detector and divided face images from non-face images. And what we found is that consistently across cultures, images with faces um, have a, a more positive or even or more polarized sentiment compared to images without faces. And this is again in line with a bunch of research in, in psychology and, and neuroscience, but this is all data driven, so we were happy to, f um, to, f to find these, these kind of patterns. And then we flip, so to continue our analysis, we, we flip the perspective and we look at those visual concepts that um, are culture specific, so that uh, there is, for which there is only one language community uh, which um, mention them in connection with emotions. And we have many of them, those are some examples, but because I'm half Italian, I always like to point out that the only language community in Flickr uh, having tax evasion as, as, a, as a visual concept connected to emotion is the Italian language community. And this makes a lot of sense if you are Italian or if you know Italians, you know what's happening out there. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, it was a, this project was a lot of fun because I could see many, uh, many usual patterns. So, uh, we then uh, progressed in our analysis to understand similarities and differences between different cultures when perceiving vision and emotion in a more kind of systematic fashion. So what we did is that for each of the language communities that we uh, had in our data set, we built a um, culture-specific sentiment detector. This means that essentially we took all images from one language community and built a sentiment detector specific for that image using an AlexNet type of deep learning network. I'm not gonna get into the details. Um, so essentially what, what these culture-specific detectors do is that, for example, given an image of, of an Italian user, the Italian detector is able to score it in terms of the way an Italian would, would express or perceive that sentiment. Um, and so the nice thing about the det this detector is not only that we have a culture-specific way to score emotions, but also is that given an image, we have a demo about it, we can, uh, given an image from, from 
from everywhere. We can also understand um, how would an Italian perceive the, the emotion in that image, or how would, uh, how would the German sentiment be, or how would the Arabic sentiment be for that image, because you have many different perspectives. And it actually changes a lot. Um, and then, um, as a last step to actually more systematically understand communalities and difference between, uh, between um, the different language communities we had, we uh, compared the, the culture-specific sentiment model to cross-lingual prediction. And essentially what we found was that, for example, the Chinese sentiment model was the most different, which means that the Chinese language community in Flickr has the most different way of expressing visual emotion compared to the other language community that we consider. While, for example, Latin language, language communities, so Italian, French, and Spanish, uh, have very similar way of expressing visual emotions. Uh, so, for example, it's very easy to score, uh, to effectively score the sentiment of Italian image, images given a sentiment detector trained on Spanish images. So this is the sense of this plot. Okay, and so in the 10, 15 minutes that I have left, 10, I don't know, um, I, th I know you have a question in mind. Like, why do we care about doing all this? And uh, so I'm, an, I'm a researcher, but I'm a researcher in industry. So we always have a kind of eye to, to uh, the business applications of what we do. So the next slides are going to probably uh, answer the, these questions you have in mind, but not the first one. Because the first one is, <laughs> is the application internal to the scientific community. So essentially, uh, one uh, reason why we do this is to close the loop. Okay, so we said we borrow a lot from uh, disciplines like the visual arts, so outside computer vision. So with this subjective machine vision technique, we can now go back to this discipline with our algorithmic findings about issues they have been discussing so that they can embed our findings in their research and then start a, a knowledge loop between uh, computational um, approaches and non-computational approaches, which I think is personally very nice, but it's not an industrial application. So let's talk about industrial application. So first one, video browsing. Okay, so imagine a video browsing platform. When you look at all these videos you have in a video browsing platform, uh, you're probably uh, going to click on one, not only because of the title, but also because of the thumbnail of the video, where the thumbnail is that single frame that needs to represent the whole video, okay? And so, I don't know if you know that, but on the server side of the, um, of the video browsing platforms, uh, thumbnail selection is not an obvious task. So, it's either left to the user who uploads the video, or it's done randomly, or it's done arbitrarily. And so, there was no kind of systematic way to select uh, that single frame in the video which will become a thumbnail. So, we designed this automatic thumbnail selection system which is a computer vision based framework that given all the frames in the video, detect that one that will become the thumbnail. And we define, uh, so we, we look for the thumbnail as the, not only the most, the frame which is most relevant to the content of the video, so using traditional computer vision technique, but also the most attractive one. Okay, because it needs to attract the user attention, it needs to be pleasing, it needs to uh, not have, you know, uh, to be of high quality, and it needs to, to be beautiful in general. So we embed into this um, thumbnail selection framework computational aesthetic features, and these bars, I couldn't, you know, I couldn't resist, I had to put some bars. Uh, these bars essentially tells us that uh, embedding knowledge regarding uh, aesthetic perception of the frame helps a lot in detecting the video thumbnail. And then the second application is about advertising. I've been working on computational advertising for a while, and uh, one of the first things that I've learned is that many ads, uh, and actually most of them, are not isolated or monomodal item. Those are multi, uh, so ads are multimodal by nature. They're not only about text. And one of the main drivers of user click is the image that, that the ad depicts. And um, also many ads, not only, so the, the image is not only important to attract clicks, but also 
it's important to have the right image to make users happy because many ads can be found offensive or unpleasant from users. And so we designed this advertising quality um, computational framework. It's an entirely multimodal framework where we, uh, w with the, a the aim of this framework is to es essentially get rid of unpleasant or offensive ads from an ad stream. Um, and this is done, of course, by analyzing all the text and sentiment, etc., but also by analyzing the content of the image and the sentiment that the image rose, the, the, the aesthetic um, pleasantness of the image. And again, we saw that by including this kind of subjective machine vision tools into an advertising uh, quality framework, we could gain a lot and we could make users happy. And the second application in advertising is about mobile advertising. Uh, so um, in, in this case, what we wanted, so we, we, work in the, we, we were working in the world of mobile advertising, and what we wanted to do was to, um, given an ad landing page, so the page where you land, I guess, after you click on an ad, uh, given this ad landing page, understand automatically how, mobile, how much mobile friendly it is and how aesthetically pleasing that, that page is. And so uh, what we did is that, of course, to automatically score landing pages in terms of mobile friendliness and aesthetics, of course, we had a lot of HTML-like features, but also we took screenshots of the ad landing pages and we extract a bunch of features regarding the composition of the image, again, the sentiment that the image arose, the brightness and, and um, the um, layout of the image, how were the objects distributed, etc. And we found that um, um, aesthetic features and the in, and uh, in general framework that uh, analyze the subjective perception of landing pages can help a lot in detecting this kind of uh, dimensions of mobile landing pages, and then going much. Uh, at a much bigger scale, uh, one of the things I've been working for many years in my life is <laughs> uh, image search. Uh, so um, uh, what happens in image search is that, I don't know if you noticed that, but when you search for images in Google Images or, or Yahoo Images or Flickr or wherever, uh, the images that are returned from, from your query, so you search for a cat and you will see a bunch of cats, so the, the images are relevant to your query, but also at the top of the ranking, so the, the, the first images are also of very high quality. So there is a lot of understanding of the image quality and the aesthetic um, dimension of the images because uh, users essentially are happy when they see beautiful images on top. Not only images of cat, but also beautiful images of cats. Okay, so uh, in, in now one of the problem is that uh, computational aesthetic frameworks are, so wh when we did this project, they were still on a kind of research prototyping mode. So. Um, what happened is that um, when we train in research projects, computational aesthetic framework, we use uh, traditionally professional image data sets. Um, and the problem is that when you apply it on, on web images, they don't work because images in the wild web are nothing but professional. There might be a few professional, but actually there's literally everything, everything in the web. So there are ranges of quality which are not included in professional image data sets. And so in this project, what we did is that uh, through deep learning, we designed a kind of transfer learning uh, network where we learn aesthetic scores from professional images and then we effectively uh, transfer this knowledge to score um, the aesthetics of web images at scale. And it actually works, and, and it's, um, it, it also helps, of course, um, retrieving beautiful pictures in large image search engines. And as a last application, um, I think this is probably one of my favorite applications. So the last context is photo sharing platform. She's not about image search. It's an, one of the other things I've been doing a, a lot in my life, but photo sharing platforms are things like Flickr or, or Instagram, to uh, 500 peaks, and um, all these uh, kind of social media that are essentially image-based. Now, 
what happened in these platforms, and we did a specific study in Flickr because this, this is a study we did back at, back at Yahoo. Uh, what happens in Flickr is that only a small percentage of Flickr pictures are actually visible to uh, any users. And those pictures tend to be the most popular pictures because popular pictures spread easily around the network, they are easily retrievable, and in general, they are, they are used, popularity is used by platforms as the main driver to surface interesting content for users. And this is fine, but what happens with these dynamics is that uh, these dynamics promote only the most popular users in the platform and not necessarily the, the best photographers in the platform. And so with my colleagues, we started thinking, what if we were able to score all images in Flickr in terms of beauty? And by doing so, we could use the intrinsic quality of the image as the main driver to surface interesting content. And by doing so, we could uh, democratize the photo sharing platform because if you're able to surface uh, high quality content instead of popular content for users, you not only make users happy uh, because they see beautiful pictures, but also you promote those photographers that receive less social attention because they don't have friends, because they are not able to, you know, uh, enter the network dynamics, etc. And um, and, but, but they are actually they, they, they deserve attention because they are they are they are uh, very good photographers, and so we actually did a, an experiment regarding this. So we took a large data set of ten around ten million Flickr pictures that were completely non-popular, so zero social attention, and we scored them with a, co with a computational aesthetic framework. And then we took the top images retrieved by this computational aesthetic framework, so the most beautiful images according to this framework, and we asked people to look at them and evaluate their beauty uh, in comparison with the most popular Flickr pictures. And we found that these non-popular pictures that were surfaced by our framework as being beautiful were considered as beautiful or even more beautiful than the most popular Flickr pictures, which made us very happy and we kind of you know, uh, in, uh, enable opportunities for democratizing for photo sharing platforms. And with that, I think I spoke enough. And we, we, I leave you with this message of democratizing photo sharing platform. I want to thank all these people uh, without all these guys, and what, they're mostly guys, yes. I wouldn't be able to do what I did uh, until now. So um, thanks a lot also to all of you for listening. And uh, I'm open for questions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm curious of how do you extrapolate from still images to video, which is a moving images, uh, and uh, with you moving I images, because I I make a. I used to be involved in multimedia production, mm -hmm. and uh, and and I'm back in AI um, because with moving images, there's so many factors that is involved in uh, uh, in video. Mm -hmm. Even if you don't look at sounds and you just look at the still images, the still images is moving, and the quality of the movement tells different things about the story mm -hmm. and how the, how good that story is. So how do you establish from still images? I'm asking because I want to know, I, I want to learn, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, to that uh, kind of quality where in a video, uh -huh. it's not just still images that you're looking at. Yeah. You are looking at yeah, yeah, yeah. the quality of the movement, the, the way people you know, interact with each other, and that's what makes a good video, and the timing of the stuff, you know? Yeah, so, uh, so regarding the, for example, the type of activities, that you can find in a video. So if someone is, um, I don't know, cutting a cake or celebrating a wedding or something like that, there is a whole branch of, of computer vision that does this kind of thing and kind of aggregates over time frames to look at, uh, to f let's say, uh, follow some points in the video to understand uh, what they mean. So if, if you will look at a still, Yeah, so they follow they follow trajectories of points in the video to understand what what the meaning of 
of the action that they are performing. For stylistic features, that this is what we're doing. Uh, for example, to understand uh, whether they, that was a stop motion video, right? What we look at is that we sampled into uh, frames at at, um, at kind of uniform intervals to understand how much the uh, objects in the in the video were were moving. So if they were moving in a kind of um, scatter way or non-continuous way, then that was a stop motion. If they were moving in a continuous way, then that was not stop motion. To understand looping artifacts, we look at, for example, how different the last frame of the video and the first frame of the video were. So you can do over time also stylistic, stylistic attributes. You can also fo follow, uh, uh, you can also follow objects just to understand from a statistic perspective how uh, whether the movement in, in the video is very entropic, so if there is a lot of movement or if, if the movement is smooth, you can follow, coarsely follow object, objects in time. So it's possible. So then if, if, uh, if you're going to, I know just now you mentioned Vine. Mm -hmm. Is Vine a software that your, your research lab do uh, make and, and, and use or is it something that is open source and is available or is it something that we can buy to, to use? Uh, Vine, uh, it's a it's social media platform so you can kind of use APIs to get data from it. It's owned by Twitter so it has the same uh, policies as Twitter. Uh, so it's kind of, l you can limit it uh, you can crawl it to a, a limited extent. If you're interested in our data set, it, it's online. We have, uh, of course, for copyright reason, we can't share videos themselves, but we have the URLs. Because it struck me if you, uh, yeah, now I can understand how you do that, but it, then I, I, I got these images in my head that it's going to be a lot of big data where each movement, for example, uh, one person in the video would be one cluster here, cluster here, and then there's a lot of big data that you need to sell makes sense if you're going to do that data science with it. Is that, how, is that the idea behind it? Yeah, so um, more or less. So the, the field, I think, of using uh, visual data for data science kind of application is, is a bit new. So we are still finding solution because it's so the visual data is very, very multidimensional and it's not directly interpretable. So, so there, are, there are different ways to do this and we are, we are studying it. Yeah, I think now I understand. Yeah. 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 I'm interested in the modifiability of a computational aesthetic. So, I mean, at a simple level, I don't want to ask a search engine, show me my subject preference with your aesthetic preference. So I want to say, I want to see my subject and my aesthetic. So that's one example. But, but beyond that, like looking into the future, like aesthetics evolve or new technical capabilities introduce events in the aesthetics that aren't perceptible or haven't been included in the framework? How do you um, envisage making things evolutionary? Yeah. So uh, about so what you were saying uh, the, the f about the first question. Uh, so personalized aesthetic ranking is something that is emerging right now. And there is actually a, a, a company in Berlin called IEM that is the, a dedicated platform for professional photographers. And they have recently introduced aesthetic, personalized aesthetic, aesthetic ranking of images. It's not an obvious task because, because you actually need to follow users for a while to understand their aesthetic preferences. And also you have to decouple what is uh, the reason why you're clicking on, on something, for example, maybe it's just because it's useful on one hand for you, for what you're looking for, and sometimes you look at it because you're attracted to it. So it's a whole new study of, uh, so a whole new area of study um, that for sure we are going in that direction. So whatever I showed you today is a, is a kind of, say, new, new uh, works in, in computer vision, so more and more we will probably go in that direction. And the second question, ah, yeah, uh, evolving, aesthetics evolving over time. So again, because this is a new field, whenever you look at aesthetic preferences from humans, you need human annotations. So uh, since we started this field, we might have started collecting aesthetic preferences. Imagine we can start, but I would love to, for example, that I would love, for example, that a hundred years ago, someone had collected aesthetics judgments on, on 
on photography so that we could study the evolution, but unfortunately it's not like that. So we could imagine things, we can look at the most popular uh, Mm, a photography style in, in time, but we don't have actual human aesthetic preferences. So, so that's the limitations of, of studying it over time. But I think from now on, we might take into consideration this, this evolution of aesthetic preferences. Yes? You yeah, just one second, because the, yeah, oops, sorry. Sure. Um, two questions. One, um, the fact that you're identifying the images based on the culture and language is pretty mm -hmm. cool. So suppose you're, you're making an advert in one country, so that's probably a simpler problem. But if, you have ma if you're making an advert like globally, uh -huh. um, what kind of factors are you taking into account? Do you take into account the cultural um, background of, for example, of North America if you're designing something regarding to North American product? Um, and the second question I will ask after you answer. Uh, yeah, so the question is what you take into account where you, where you do a, cam a, a global campaign. Yes. I'm not a marketing person, so I, I cannot like, answer you directly. Uh, so I, I mean, I would love to answer you, but I'm, I don't know so much about marketing. I guess, uh, so one of the applications of these, of, of these tools is, is exactly this. So you want to understand uh, which kind of cultures, uh, so which, which kind of visual ob objects are related to which kind of af affective reaction. So for example, say in Italy, uh, purple brings bad luck. So you don't want to use so much purple, not, so for example, in, in theaters, you will never see any, any of the characters dressed in purple because it brings bad luck and the play can, can, go, can go bad or, I mean, if they can, it can, something bad can happen if you dress in purple, right? S these kind of things. Um, so definitely you can take into consideration this, these aspects, yeah. Ask marketing people more better than me. And the second question: uh, Do you use research by Daniel Kahneman or anything like behavioral psychology? For example, the, the the pictures where you have a face, smiling face, will be more favorable than the picture without anything. Yeah. Nature. So. Uh, Okay, I think some of this research we don't we don't directly use this research, but we are we are kind of we would like to study it, um, especially because at some point what we would like to do is to understand behavioral change. So how can images images generate be a change in your behavior, a change in your uh, affective state, for example, in your emotional state. So if you are depressed, are there images that I can show you to make you, to make you feel better? So definitely we are, we are going in that direction. Yes. Anyone else? Yes. Um, yeah, sorry, uh, one of the slides there mentioned something about uh, ontology. Yeah. Um, I just wonder if maybe just, just if you can. Yeah, uh, so. Thanks for picking it up, because actually I call an image data set uh, an ontology, which doesn't, you know, there, rem there is a mismatch, because the an ontology is about, is about semantic concepts, and the, I'm, I'm talking about images here, about a, a, a set of images. So the, the ontology itself is a set of visual concepts across 12 languages uh, organized according to semantic properties. So those visual concepts are what we call adjective noun pairs. So for example, beautiful dog or happy dog or uh, beautiful sunshine, things like that. So those adjective noun pairs uh, are selected as the one uh, that co-occur very often with emotion keywords in the, in the Flickr image collection. So those are emotion bias concepts. And then we organize them according to semantics. So can, um, I don't know, all the dog-related adjective known pairs are in one part of the ontology. And then we organize the adjective accordingly, etc. So this is the ontology of these concepts. And the images uh, are retrieved as the one being tagged in Flickr with these concepts. And the reason why we have positive negative sentiment annotations is because we have positive negative annotations on these concepts collected on crowdsourcing. Yeah. I don't have time to explain all this, so I, I kind of squeeze, squeeze everything. Yeah? 
Do you have any uh, GitHub repos you would suggest we could look at for code to uh, you know, substantiate this? Yeah, so we do have, uh, so uh, because we work for, our, for uh, in, we, we will have more in the future because uh, from, from we have intentions as a team in the Bell Labs to publish much more code. So one of the main things that we have available online are, is, are the data sets. So all the data that we collected with aesthetic preferences, creative preferences, sentiment preferences, it's out there. Um, and we do have uh, detectors available for these culture-specific sentiment detectors are available. Unfortunately, I can't share um, the features code or, or the, or the um, say, learning framework code for other, for other um, frameworks because of uh, company limitations. Sorry. Did you find evidence that men evaluate images differently from women? I'm thinking, for example, of looking at a, a Ferrari and a baby, for example. Yeah, so no, this is something, um, in, in it's actually much more broad than this. It, this is something that is very, very interesting for me uh, to see uh, how different demographic uh, properties actually impact your way of uh, assessing beauty or sentiment in an image. So we are starting going in, that, in this direction because not only we would like to, this is useful for personalization of, of, um, of content, of um, aesthetic ranking or sentiment based ranking, uh, but also um, this, so we, we envision ways to actually Im embed this kind of diversity in aesthetic preferences into an aesthetic uh, scorer, let's say. Because right now what we're doing is that we are squashing one single notion of aesthetics, so the average of all uh, judgments of, on a pictures, we're squashing this into a machine and the machine learns the average aesthetic, kind of flattening everybody aesthetic values. So we would like to have ways to embed different, um, so all this diversity in aesthetic perception in, in, uh, in these kind of subjective machine vision frameworks. But this is something definitely where we are, we want. and it's also interesting because, for example, for aesthetic perception, there are two, uh, two different schools of thought. One that's aesthetic is universal and actually is a part of our evolutionary process. So everybody feels, uh, everybody uh, has the same notion of beauty, right? Um, there are many philosophers that things like that, including um, Kant at the beginning of, of everything. And then um, uh, there is another school that says that aesthetic is, uh, is uh, and culture. So it depends very much on, on, on uh, so it's kind of in the eye of the beholder. So these two theories can be tested through actual data. But we are getting there. So thanks a lot for this question because I'm very happy to answer. Yeah. 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 Uh, there was there was another question, but that's fine. Yeah, we we can talk. This yeah. Oh yeah, is it late? I don't know. I can. Talk.